guys, welcome back to another episode of the Premier League Appetizer Show. I'm Coach Indy. Welcome back to the Asian One to One Football Coaching Channel. Of course, if you haven't subscribed already, click the button right now. Once you watch the video, leave a like as well. All them likes, it will mean a lot. And also leave a comment as well about the video, what you liked about the video, what you want to see more of, what you haven't seen and you would like to see. All them kind of things, guys. But yeah, subscribe right now if you can. Um, so today's episode is effectively another another preview to what we're building up to, which is the 2021 season of the Premier League. Um, we had a, a brief episode left last week and we'll have a, a, another sort of fairly-ish brief one today. Um, so on today's episode, it's, it's a jam-packed one, guys, so we'll run through loads of different things. So the first thing we talk about is pre-season games. So there's been loads and loads of games that happened over the last week to 10 days. So we'll run through a bunch of those Maybe talk about some of the good results, maybe some performances that players have put in as well, and other sort of key moments that may have happened, um, maybe with new signings, for example, in their opening pre-season games. Then we'll more move on to the, some of the transfers in and the, some of the transfers out, and also the possible rumours that are going around as well, things that may materialise, things that are in the pipeline, um, all them kind of things we'll talk about as well. Then we'll move on to the Community Shield, which happened yesterday. So Liverpool versus Arsenal at Wembley. We'll talk about that and how that went for both teams. Um, I won't spoil the result, just in case uh, you guys don't know about it yet. So you have to wait till later in the episode to find out if you don't know already. And then there's uh, a category here which we're going to talk about is other news, which there's absolutely loads to talk about. So we've got the Messi situation, we've got the Maguire situation, we've got... Harry Kane, we've got Raheem Sterling, we've got the England squad, we've got Pogba situation. There's guys, there's so much to talk about. So I'll dive straight in. We'll talk about the preseason friendlies to start with. So, like I said, over the last sort of week or so to 10 days, there's been loads and loads of games. We'll kick off with Spurs. The Spurs have had three games of, uh, of preseason so far, which is probably one of the, the teams that have played the most games so far. They've won all three of their games. They've won 3 0, 4 1, and 1 0. And the last game being, yes. Today, yes, still a Friday night, uh, beating Birmingham one 0 So they've had a th- yeah, like a three 0 win, which Son scored two and Cessnion scored. They had a four one win against Reading. Um, I think it was an own goal. Lamella, Son scored another, so he's one to keep an eye out for the coming season. And Deli Ali scored. And then yeah, they, they beat Birmingham up yesterday or the day before. Bergwijn's gone very late on, so. Really, really strong sort of, um, if you just look at the results in isolation and pre-season is pre-season, it's not all about results, it's not the primary goal. But certainly, Mourinho was, you remember last season, he kept saying over and over and over again, I want to fast forward until the summer, I want to fast forward where, so we can work for these players and get some principles and play and some, some DNAs which they can't go away from and you know and work on the training ground and, and that's what he's been able to do. And, Early signs are that it's they're looking it's looking good for them. Um, they have got one more friendly scheduled, which is next week. I believe they're playing Watford. So when the international games are on, when all the international players have gone to wherever they need to go, the players that stay behind will play another friendly against Watford. So yeah, that's looking very good for for Spurs. Move on to Liverpool. So they've had a couple of friendlies plus the the Community Shield, and we'll come to the Community Shield later on. So we won't touch on that just yet. But they've had two games over in Austria, so they sort of did go on a pre- mini pre-season tour, if you like, in Austria. So they created a bubble in Austria and, and played a couple of teams over there. First game they won three 0 and then the second game they drew two two. In the two two game, Rian Brewster or Brewster, sorry, came on and scored a brace. So that was very good from a from a young player's point of view and a, you know, from a confidence point of view as well for him. Um, so yeah, sort of one win and, and one draw for them. So that's pretty pretty good for Liverpool. Um, then moving on to you've got Everton they drew Blackpool 3-3 I think that was last weekend also had Arsenal play I think it was Milton Keynes away they won 4-1 so a very good result for them then you've got uh, West Ham another team who've played lots and lots of games so far so they've played three games same as what Spurs have and actually they've had three wins as well so um, certainly West Ham sort of continuing Again, it's pre-season goals, I understand that, but they're sort of continuing their momentum they gained at the back end of last season into sort of their pre-season form. So they have um, they actually had two games on one day, I believe, it might have been last weekend, where they, they won 
one four and they won one five. Um, and I think Haller scored a hat trick, and there was other goal scorers. I think maybe Masawaku scored and Lanzini scored, and there's plenty of minutes for lots of different players. You know, playing lots of lots of minutes, trying to get minutes under the belt ready for you know obviously the, the season starting in, in, in two weeks' time. So and then they had another game, um, maybe yesterday I think it was, and they won two one. So they've had three wins. I'm sure they've probably got something scheduled for next weekend as well, like Spurs, probably like most teams if they if they um, if they can line up a friendly in some way against a, a team that's got plenty of players available as well, whether it be from Championship or whatever. Um, but if not, if they don't, I'd imagine all these teams will play in-house friendlies just so they get the players ticking over, getting them minutes, etc. Um, Sheffield United, they played, I think it was Hearts up in Scotland last weekend, and they were winning 1-0 um, during the game. Billy Sharp, I believe, scored. But the game got abandoned because of... Uh, well, the weather was atrocious. The pitch was waterlogged, so um, they didn't they didn't complete that game. But they were winning one nil, so you know you can't really probably read into that too much. Uh, we move on to Newcastle next. They've had a couple of wins. They won three nil and two one. Um, thing to note about those two games is Andy Carroll, who's you know might be maybe been out of favour. Certainly was sort of, since he since he joined the club. Not because he wasn't playing well or anything like that. It's just because other players were doing quite well. You had St. Maximum playing well. I know he wasn't playing the same position, but you had Almiron. Joe Linton was actually doing all right. They had a spell where um, Dwight Gale was doing well. But yeah, Andy Carroll scored in both these games. So that's one to sort of mention and sort of note maybe going forward for anyone that's playing, you know, any of these fantasy games online or anything like that. That's Andy Carroll's maybe one to, to put on your watch list if you like. Uh, likewise with Crystal Palace, they've had a couple of friendlies. They've won... Both games as well, 2-1 and 2-1. Um, I believe AU scored a brace in the first game and then maybe Zaha scored one of the goals yesterday and um, passed on the other goal. Uh, but they've had a couple of wins, which is really promising for them. Then we move on to Leicester and they have played two games. So they won their first game 2-0, which was last weekend. And then they had a game yesterday, which they blanked and drew 0-0, which... You know, two clean sheets, which is pretty good going. Thing to note with Leicester is they've got a few players sort of missing. It certainly seems like um, going into the season, they've definitely got Johnny Evans missing because he serves a three-game ban after picking up a red card against Manchester United in the last game of last season. You've got Ricardo Pereira who picked up a fairly bad injury, but I believe it might be an ACL injury, so he's going to be out certainly for at least the first. I would have thought at least a month or or two of the season. Um, then you've also got James Madison who's been um, he's had a sort of an ongoing hip problem that sort of had happened at the back end of last season it's kind of continued on to this season so he's touch and go so he, he might be fit but we're not sure just yet with him so yeah Leicester sort of although they've had a couple of clean sheets and have won one and drawn one again I appreciate the, the results aren't everything but um, they've, they've done okay in pre-season and there's sort of players here there and everywhere where Possibly available or not. Um, a couple more games to just to mention, guys. We had West Brom. They played Forest yesterday, um, and they lost one 0 So it's the first sort of Premier League team to actually lose a game um, that I can recall. Um, again, I keep I keep banging on about it. The, the results aren't the most important thing in preseason. It's all about match sharpness, match rhythm, um, cohesion, partnerships. Um, you know, working on certain formations, all them kind of things are, you know, they're more paramount than what the result is in pre-season. So, um, but certainly it's a good habit to create and certainly a good habit to, to get into. So, um, okay, moving on to the last game, which was the last game I, I sort of want to mention and the reason why I left it till last was because it was Chelsea, or Brighton versus Chelsea, sorry, and the game finished 1-1. That's the first thing to note. Um, this was a pilot test for fans, for spectators to come into the into the stadium and, and to see sort of how it went and you know did it all the sort of safe, safety procedures match uh, and meet the criteria of what the government liked and, and what the results on the back of it was a and obviously we, d we don't know just just yet because it's only been twenty four hours or so but you know is there is there a massive increase in coronavirus coronavirus cases we don't know just yet but they're the sort of things that the government would be looking for hence why it's a pilot sort of tester uh, event if you like. Um, so they had 2,500 fans there, I 
I believe they're all Brighton fans, but I could be wrong. Um, I've only seen a couple of clips where the, obviously the fans are all spread out. They're not sort of um, you know in lines and lines together. You know, there's there's two over here. There might be three over there, depending on sort of you know family-wise, you know what it may be. So that's really promising. And you know, if that goes well, fingers crossed, and there's no sort of negative press and feedback on the back of that, then there might be one or two others that um, sort of get the nod as well and then hopefully that's a view to sort of bring in fans into the stadiums as of October. Um, in terms of the, the, the game itself, Chelsea obviously have loads and loads of new players that they've signed and um, they integrated into this team. So, they sorry guys, integrated into the team and gave Davies too. So, most notably, they've Timo Werner and um, Zaik, them two players, both started the game. Um, and incidentally, they were both involved in the goal as well. So um, Ziyech played a lovely little sort of reverse ball into the box for actually Callum Hudson Odoi. He had an absolutely atrocious header, meant to sort of head it on goal, but he's mistimed it's gone that way. It's landed to Werner perfectly, he's got to happen. So Werner scored on his um, Chelsea debut, if you like, albeit pre season. And then late on, um, Gross scored for Brighton with a penalty. Now, Brighton did have another penalty missed earlier on in the game as well, but um, nevertheless, a 1 1 game. Very, very positive in terms of the fans being there. Um, so, yeah, things are looking up in terms of the fans and sort of getting back to some sort of um, normality in terms of the fans being in the stadium and, and, and the players sort of enjoying and playing for the fans, if you like. Okay, guys, we'll just move on to um, some of the transfer news and some of the incomings and outgoings uh, and some of the rumours as well so there's been loads and loads of transfers that have happened uh, but we'll just mention some of the key ones if you like uh, that have happened over the last sort of week or so um, we'll start with Chelsea because Chelsea have been the most active team in the market and the, the busiest t team well this week certainly they find they've signed three players just this week alone and there could be a fourth one coming in the next sort of 24 hours or so as well so first one to sort of mention is Ben Chilwell so he's departed from Leicester, which is a big loss for Leicester and a massive gain for Chelsea. I believe the fee was around £50 million. Pounds. Now, I've seen things online and listened to a few Leicester fans and Chelsea fans. And Leicester fans think he's not much of a loss, which I completely disagree with. And Chelsea fans don't think it's that much of a gain, which they think it's a gain to, compared to Alonso and um, Emerson, but it's not like, it's not an Andy Robertson, it's not a Marcelo back in his prime, for example, you know. But it's certainly an improvement and a step in the right direction. Um, but I think it's a very, very good sign for Chelsea. I think, I think it's a bigger loss for Leicester than what Leicester fans think. It's a bigger gain for Chelsea fans than what they think. So they signed him. They went on to sign um, a lad called Malang Sives, a centre-back from a club in France. It might have been Lille or someone like that. I'm not entirely sure. But he's actually... Um, Sorry, they didn't sign him from Lille. He was actually a, he was a free agent. I think he might have left a, a team in France, but he's gone. They've they've signed him and then sent him out on loan to a team in France, I believe. And he's a young centre back, so he's one for the future, um, possibly to bring in next year. Then they signed from the other side of the spectrum, an absolute veteran of the game, an absolute legend of the game, uh, Thiago Silva. He's another centre back, so he's they've signed him um, on a one year deal with a view to. Uh, another year contract um, on the back of that, depending on how well he does in his, in his first year. So he signed, I think I believe it was on the Thursday, or, yeah, I think it was a Thursday, flew in on the Friday, um, and now he has to have a 14-day quarantine. So he should be available for the first game of the season. I believe that works out about right, because Chelsea played on Monday night. Whether he'll be thrown in or not is a different matter altogether, but knowing what he's like with his experience, and he's not, he's not being brought in to just be a squad player he's not going to be there to just help the young player he's going to play I believe it that is the case there's only last weekend where he was he played he played really really well despite being on the losing team against a prolific Bayern Munich team who've been battering teams left right and centre so they signed him um, a couple of others sort of to mention you've got uh, Thea Robinson who signed for Fulham now this is an interesting one because this might have a bit of a knock on effect with a couple of other players as well so um, they signed uh, Theo Robinson from Wigan for a fee, I believe, around £2 million, pounds, which is peanuts in this day, day and age and in this sort of climate, if you like. Um, the reason why I say this might have an off effect is 
uh, Joe Bryan, the the current left back for um, Fulham, he's been linked quite heavily with um, Leicester City. Um, obviously, they need a, re- a replacement at their, at their position at left back as well. So, um, so it's a bit of a bit of a knock on effect potentially. Um, Leicester have been linked with other players as well, but uh, yeah, Robertson's come through the door for, for Fulham. So it's a good signing for them. Um, there's a lot of clubs actually linked with Robertson before Fulham actually got the deal done. There was three or four other Premier League clubs as well that were interested. So good signing for them. Jeff Hendrick, he signed on a free. He obviously was released by Burnley in the summer. Um, he signed for Newcastle United. So it's a, it's a good squad player to have. Steve Bruce has done quite well there. He's a, he's a um, multifunctional player as well. He can play in sort of two, three, four different positions as well, which is always important, especially around the busiest periods around Christmas and, and Easter time where there's loads and loads of games. So it's very handy to have a player like that in your squad. Um, a few other ones to mention as well. Crystal Palace have signed Eze from uh, the Championship Club QPR, which is a good sign. A, a very tricky, direct, fast, dynamic winger who did quite well in the Championship. Had lots of um, lots of goals and assists last season for a, for a young player. Still obviously got loads of room to develop and to progress into what Crystal Palace believe that he can be. Now, some people might say he might be a replacement for Zaha. That might be the case, but i tell you what, if Zaha doesn't go and they've got both those two on the wings with maybe an AU um, in there as well, maybe as a striker or as a number 10, I can see possibly Crystal Palace changing um, maybe a little bit of their style um, in terms of sort of uh, be a bit more progressive and a bit more sort of flamboyant going forward. So definitely it could be a very, very clever and astute sign in there for Roy Hodgson in Crystal Palace. A um, couple of other ones to mention. We've got Rodrigo. So uh, Rodrigo is a striker that used to play for Bolton in the Premier League. I think he only scored one goal. This was about 10 years ago, guys. He was at Valencia, um, doing quite well there for them um, in La Liga. He has signed for Leeds United, so... Bielsa has got a fantastic player there, potentially a fantastic player um, over the line. They obviously need more competition and um, more goals in their team going forward. They've obviously got Bamford and they did have Enketia for part of the season. They won't get him back because he'll stay at Arsenal. Um, but he's, I think it was a record signing, around £30 million. I think it's overtook Leeds United's um, transfer when they signed Rio Ferdinand from West Ham. So... Yeah, it's a very good, good signing for them. It'll be interesting to see how well he does and adapts to the Premier League. And the last one to sort of mention that sort of actually happened this morning, uh, guys, which is um, Doherty from from Wolves. So the wing back who plays for Wolves uh, and for Ireland, he's actually signed for Spurs. Uh, there was, I think I did mention this last week about um, he was linked with Spurs. It just came out of nowhere, so I sort of mentioned it in my rumour column. But it actually has progressed into something a bit serious. And I think they've got an absolute bargain here as well it sounds like it's about 16 million euros so about 50 million pounds initial fee rising up to about 20 million pounds um, obviously he can play as a wing back and he, that's what he has predominantly done but he also can play as a right back and a back four as well um, and also helps um, because obviously they've, they've sold Carl Walker pieces and they're probably going to sell Serge Aurier as well so I'd imagine he'll come straight into the team um, with maybe one of the youngsters, if Oreo does go as, as a backup. So, uh, like I said, just touched on this, we're talking some of the rumours now. Uh, obviously, Sergio has been linked with I believe, AC Milan and another European team as well. Um, Spurs won about £25 million pound for him. Um, they'll probably get about 20 probably maybe a little a tad more than what they paid for Doherty. Um, so, uh, yep, he's one player that will be linked. So, um, I think that one will happen, whether it's AC Milan or another team, I'm not sure, but I think he will leave. Um, and then the other one I sort of mentioned is I touched on Brian already from Fulham. He, um, like I said, been linked with Leicester, so he might be sort of going in the next sort of couple of weeks. Um, the big one that we spoke about, I feel like it's going to be a theme every week, guys, is Jaden Sancho. He's the one that seems to be the one that's going to be sort of being drawn out throughout the whole summer. So obviously he's been linked with Man United. United have said that. Well, this is all allegedly, guys. This is what you hear, you know, in the papers or it be online or whatever. Um, they're not willing to pay £108 million in today's climate because of what's going on with the pandemic. Um, and that's what Dortmund want. They want £108 million, which is €120 million. Euros, and they want it. There's no negotiating on that. So they want that. And that's what it is. So we're interested to see how that develops, whether United can create some funds to, to pay for that. 
So they might not have enough money as it stands right now. They might sell, I don't know, Chris Small and Phil Jones, them types of players, Pereira, and create some funds and they might be able to do the deal. So that's one to, I think that will be ongoing throughout the summer. A few other ones to mention as well. Um, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, he has been linked with Wolves. Um, obviously now Doty has gone. He has been linked. Um, so he was linked last week and I thought he would be a replacement for the left wing back Johnny because he's picked up a serious injury. So to have some cover there, but also he can play centre midfield as well. But now Doty has gone, I'm thinking he might just go as right wing back. Um, and obviously he can do a job at the left side if he needs that side or, you know, say Wolves do sign another right wing back and they do sign Maitland Niles as well. And he plays. He might play on the left side. He might play in midfield. So he's been linked with there. Um, I'm not sure if that one would sort of go through. I believe Wolves have made a bit of 50 million pounds. Arsenal rejected it. They want closer to 20 million. And then there's three others. I just want to mention, guys. They're all linked to the same team. Um, and I would say two of them will probably happen, and one might not. Equally, they all might happen as well. It just depends how ambitious this club are and how much this club want to back. Um, the manager so the club is Everton and the manager is Carlo, Carlo Ancelotti so they've got a world class manager there um, and they are, are they willing as, as a club are they ambitious enough to sort of back the manager so the three players have been linked with is Hamad Rodriguez of Real Madrid which is you know if you if you rewind back to 2014 in that World Cup and he won I think he won player of the tournament or he won um, the Golden Boot or something like that he got his move on the back of that to Real Madrid so he's obviously got some pedigree and obviously Ancelotti knows him as well from his time when he was manager of Real Madrid, so that would be a real coup if, if, if you know if everything can sign him. Moving on, they, they want to sign the Napoli centre midfielder Allen as well. I believe actually a fee has been agreed for about twenty five million pounds. Um, I think that has been um, confirmed by sources in Sky. Um, well, it's sorry, Sky Italy. Sorry, uh, and then the last player is Decore. So Decore plays for Watford currently at the moment. And obviously Watford have been relegated to the Championship. Um, he is far too good to play in the Championship. And there's probably a host of clubs that have been interested in, um, in signing him. Um, but if, if they signed to Decore as well, Everton, and they got obviously the other two as well, that is a, a very, very, very strong window, a very positive window, a very ambitious window, um, both for Everton and, and Ancelotti and the owners as well. So, yeah, again, guys, some of these might materialise over the next week or so, so we might talk about them. In a bit more depth, you know, deals might go over the line, or they might be a lot closer, and there might be other rumours that sort of be created as well um, as time goes on. Okay, to move on to the Community Shield. So, I saw this game yesterday. Um, I have to say, I, I think on the balance of play, I think Arsenal deserved to win the game. Um, the result finished one-one, and they went to, to penalties, and Arsenal did win the game five-four on penalties. Um, so there's loads of, loads of um, information that uh, players um, who play fantasy games, for example, um, but also like other Premier League clubs can scout these teams as well because obviously the game was aired um, on British TV or on BT Sport. So there's those opportunities to sort of basically scout both teams and scout the players, if you like. So I just want to mention a few things to give you guys more of a heads up of maybe what... Um, you won't maybe be able to see or if you haven't been able to see the game or whatever it may be. So Liverpool played a almost strongest, almost their strongest team, um, certainly on paper, but they had a couple of injuries as well. So they those two players missed out. So the two players that missed out were Jordan Henderson, which he had a bit of an injury back end of last season, which he should be fine for certainly the early part of the season. You know, he might miss the first game, but after that he should be fine. And also Trent, which is a little bit more worrying, I would suggest, um, as he hasn't played a minute yet. They've had obviously had three games in Liverpool. He hasn't played one minute yet, so he's had a bit of an ongoing um, issue. I'm not sure what the inj injury is. Um, I don't believe it's long term. The rumours I'm hearing is that he'll probably miss the first game of the season, maybe two max, and then he'll be fine. He might also be fit for the first game of the season. It just depends how sort of his body reacts to you know whenever he comes back into training and. You know, goes at sort of full intensity and exposes that injury, if you like. Um, so yeah, Liverpool. Those two players that missed out. Some players that come in were um, Nico Williams coming at right back, and then James Milner come in in centre midfield. Apart from that, Liverpool were at the strongest. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, and they also played their normal formation. So there's no sort of differences differences there. There's no surprises that Klopp sprung on people or Arteta there. 
Um, Arsenal play the formation they've stuck with in the semi-final and the final of the FA Cup, which was a 1-3-5-2-3. Um, um, team was uh, Martinez in goal. Interestingly, Leno is back fit and he did start, uh, or did play sorry, some minutes in their last game, um, but didn't in this game, which was very, very interesting. So watch your space for him, because um, it's not guaranteed that Leno's going to be number one. I would suggest, um, especially on the back of some of the comments that Martinez made at the back end of the last season slash at the end of the season where he said, it was after the FA Cup final, I believe, actually, you know, he, he helped win them and he was really emotional and, you know, because he's basically been a bit of a journeyman, he hasn't had many games for Arsenal, he's been on loan many times. And he basically said that, I'll, you know, I'll, I, was, I knew I was going to be able to be an Arsenal one an Arsenal number one at some point in my career I knew I'd be able to win trophies and now I've got a taste of it I want to play I want to play more so he's, he's very much up for the fight so um, yeah very, he didn't make a mistake either so guys so it's not like you know he came in for three four games and he just did a job to you know until Leno was fit and he made a couple of errors so Leno's going to go straight back in it wasn't like that he actually held his own and he didn't look out of place at all so that'd be interesting to see how sort of he um so yeah, we're interested to see how 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 Arteta deals with that goalkeeping scenario and situation. Um, so as it stands right now, I'll say it's about fifty fifty. Um, and then the rest of the team, they had um, Ainsley Maitland Niles play. They had on the left side, they had um, as a wing back, they had Bellerin as a right wing back, um, Holden, David Luiz, and Kieran Tierney. Two in midfield, they had El Nenny. Interesting. Hasn't played much under Arteta, but um, due to other players, have been unavailable or going back to their parent club. So Danny Sabias has gone back to his parent club. They Arsenal do want to sign him, with whether um, they can agree a fee with Real Madrid. And then Windozi, who did play quite a bit with, for Arteta initially when he came in, has obviously fallen out, and it looks likely he's going to leave. So and only come in and actually did quite well. Looked um, a good player. Uh, looked sharp. He was alongside Granit Xhaka, who's pretty much an ever-present for Arsenal in that centre midfield. Um, and the three up top, top was um, Sacco, uh, Bami on the left, and then Ketia up top. And interestingly, Lacazette um, wasn't in the squad and he didn't have an injury. So that's a very, very interesting one. Now, he has been linked with Atletico Madrid in the past and more recently he's been linked with Juventus. So very interesting to see how that goes. Um, I could see potentially if Lacazette does get sold, Aubameyang moving up top as a main striker, and then William playing on the left, and then Pepe on the right. That could that could be a front three that could work for for Arsenal, and that's a bit harsh. Maybe you could say on certainly on Saka because he contributed a lot to the team in all competitions last season, and even Enketia to a certain extent, more so in the second half of the season. Um, but yeah, just going back to the game itself. Um, like I said, Arsenal won the game five from penalties. They probably had the better chances. They looked the sharper. Liverpool did have a goal uh, disallowed um, for um, offside from Van Dijk early on in the game, but it was the right decision. Um, goal scoring wise, Aubameyang scored the goal. Uh, seems to just do Aubameyang things, which is play in FA Cups and score goals, play at Wembley and score goals, which he's done in the last three games, scored five goals. Um, seems to be his sort of second home, if you like. Um, and then for Liverpool, um, young Minamino scored for Liverpool, came on as a sub. Um, sort of lucky Ricochet landed to him and he finished it quite nicely. So that was quite good for them. Lots of players got lots of minutes. There was some rotation from, from both teams. Not as much as you would see traditionally in a, in a pre-season game, if you like. Um, so yeah, there's plenty sort of information to, to take and absorb and you know sort of digest and, and, and use that going forward. Um, from a scouting point of view. Okay, guys, we'll just move on to uh, other news, if you like. There's loads to talk about, so um, also, there's nowhere else to start but with Lionel Messi. Okay, so there's loads to talk about with this. Lionel Messi has handed in a written transfer request to leave Barcelona. So there's rumours going around of this sort of Monday night going into Tuesday, and it was confirmed Tuesday that it did happen. Um, so he has... When he when he negotiated or his father negotiated um, his last contract, which was a few years ago, um, a couple of things that he wanted in his contract was that he was able to leave for free um, up until the thirty first of May. I think it was a ten day period from the thirty first of May to the tenth of June, where 
in that period there he can say to the club I can leave I can leave for free providing he leaves or oh, sorry providing he hands in a written transfer request so that hasn't happened that's the first thing to sort of mention um, but he has handed in a transfer request a couple like I said last sort of three four five days ago um, so on the back of that there's been loads of loads of rumours going around that uh, he's been linked with Manchester City for obvious reasons with Guardiola and and, and some of the, the background staff in terms of the hierarchy, like, uh, is it, um, Tixie and people like that who used to be at Barcelona, They're, then being at Manchester City. Um, and also Manchester City want to win the Champions League as well. One other thing to sort of mention as well, the, the, the owner um, had an interview, with so Manchester City owner had an interview, I think it was maybe two days before, um, before the news was announced, saying that we... Target young players, and we want to have want to see them develop and grow and have some sort of market value. You know, if they do want to uh, be sold for whatever reason, i.e., Leroy Sane, for example. And that's not to say they they won't sign an old player at all. But generally speaking, if you look at all the players they've signed, they've signed players that have sort of mainly between twenty and twenty five, and then maybe between sort of twenty four and twenty seven. Most of most of the players, goalkeepers might be slightly different. But his interview was really interesting because he, he starts to change slightly. He said, we are willing to sign an older player. We, we, or older players. He came out and said that. Would, no one really took um, much notice of that comment. It was just a, a, a passing comment, if you like. But then on the back of what's happened with Messi in Barcelona, people are putting two and two together thinking, hang on a minute, there might be something in this. And there might well be. We don't know. Just speculating here, guys. Um, so that's happened. PSG have declared some interest in it. Juventus have. Um, whether these teams can afford it, I don't know. Inter Milan have got rich owners as well, whether they can afford it. Man United, from a Man United's point of view, being a Man United fan, I absolutely love it to happen. Realistically, we're probably bottom of the queue in terms of the teams I've just mentioned. Um, but you never know. You might be a fan of Manchester and you might be a fan of playing for the Reds. Wishful thinking, I know, but... Uh, guys, in the comments right now, if you can, where do you think it's most likely if Messi was to leave, where is, where's the club and where's the league he would play? Where's it, where is it most likely? Is it Spain? Um, well, it would not be Spain, sorry, because he's not going to go to Real Madrid. But would it be Italy, for example, if a couple of teams I mentioned there? Would it be France with PSG because they've got loads and loads of money? Um, and would it be England? Um, and there's a few clubs I mentioned there as well. Um, you can add Chelsea into that list if you wanted to as well. So, yeah, leave a comment now, guys. Where do you think he's going to be going? Go back to the Messi situation because I keep sort of digressing a little bit. Um, so, yeah, he's obviously handed in a written transfer request. He, on his holidays, I believe, as well. So no one knew exactly where he was. Um, ha so as the days have evolved... Um, Messi's team have come out and said that, uh, sorry, allegedly have said, I don't know, these are just things that come out through the press, whether this happened or not, I don't know exactly, but I'm just sort of speculating here and going along with what I've heard, is that he wasn't going to initially return back to pre-season uh, training um, and he wasn't going to come back for COVID test, uh, which was meant to be happening today, I believe, yes. Um, but since then, he's been advised to actually do that because... Um, if there was a, a move to, uh, if, if a move was to materialise, that would sort of be against him, and you know Barcelona could use that against him, saying you know you're not, um, you know, obliged to your part of your you know contractual requirements, etc. So um, he was advised to do that. He turned, um, I think he was back in Barcelona yesterday, um, and then interestingly, today he was meant to have a, a allocated slot at 10:15 um, to come in and have his coronavirus. Okay, guys, moving on to other news, and there's nowhere else to start with apart from the line of message news. So, if you don't know already, where have you been? Firstly, it literally has been all over the news, it's been all over the internet, papers, you name it, everyone's talking about it. So, Lionel Messi has handed in a written transfer request to leave Barcelona Football Club, which is, I didn't think that would ever happen. I thought he's going to see out the rest of his career um, at Barcelona. Worst case scenario, he might leave with maybe a year or two of playing time and going to play in Argentina. That that was the worst case scenario. But if not, he was going to have to stay at Barcelona for the remainder of his career and, and retire there. 
Um, so yeah, so for him to hand in a written transfer request, that is unbelievable news. So that happened sort of Tuesday of this week, so sort of three or four days ago. Um, it was sort of announced through sort of the public on the Tuesday, but there was rumours going around on the Monday night that that did happen or was going to happen. So um, yeah, he wants to leave Barcelona. Um, obviously Barcelona, why would they want to sell him? Um, unless they've got maybe really struck, I mean, they might have financial difficulties. Um, I don't know. Um, so Barcelona believe he has a release clause of 700 million euros in his contract. So he can't leave um, for anything less than that. As soon as that's been triggered, then he's then Messi's can go and negotiate with the club that's met that request. Whereas Messi is saying, no, I can leave for free. So, which, if you look at both sides of the spectrum, that is like, there's no middle ground here. This is zero over here. And this is 700 million euros over here. So like, it's not like, oh no, 350 or 400 or whatever it may be. There's literally two different sides of the spectrum. So there's two different sides of the arguments and obviously one of them's incorrect and one of them's incorrect. Um, my suspicion is that Barcelona are correct and Messi is incorrect and Messi's team is incorrect, should I say. So just you have to rewind back a little bit to sort of get some context to why Messi thinks he can leave for free. So <coughs> he... And his team, which is his, his father is his agent, he negotiated um, in his last contract, which was a couple of years ago, um, that he could leave um, every summer for, for zero pounds, for, for zero million euros, um, between dates, as long as he informed the club by the 31st of May that he wanted to do that, then they had a 10 day window up until the 10th of June to make it happen. And then if that didn't happen, then he had to stay at the club, basically. Um, so during those dates, um, Messi had not said anything to the club at all. He has not mentioned anything to the club. He's not written anything to the club, anything like that. Um, now you got to bear in mind we've, we've gone through a global pandemic, so um, the season is still ongoing. So normally by the thirty first of May the season is finished, whether it be the, the league or the Champions League. If Barcelona have reached that far, so that's why that date's been was negotiated in the contract. But obviously because of the global pandemic, the Champions League was still happening, the Liga was still happening. So technically in Messi's eyes and his team's eyes, the season hasn't finished. So technically that clause is still open, if you like. Um, whereas Barcelona's argument is, it's the dates, forget about the global pandemic, it's the dates that's relevant here, not the end of the season. So that's both sides of the argument. So. Um, there was talks of Messi, well firstly he's not in Spain, um, he's most likely in Argentina, this was sort of on the Tuesday, Wednesday, um, so no one could actually get an interview from him, um, or even knew exactly where he was, but there was rumours that he was in Argentina with his family. Um, so Barcelona um, obviously said their piece um, amongst sort of themselves and it sort of spread out to the media etc. And there was there was talks a little bit that sort of Messi had done maybe a, an interview or some some um, quotes had come out to the public in Argentina um, that he said he wanted to have a meeting with the club on the Saturday um, to see if one to make sure he he is going to leave the club and that his demands or his request is is met um, and if 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 they the club declined that then he wouldn't turn up to training and he wouldn't turn up for COVID testing, which incidentally happened today. Um, so, but the other, the twist on that is, if Messi didn't turn off for training and didn't turn off for COVID uh, testing, then he technically isn't um, obliging to his contractual requirements, which go against him. If it, you know, if this thing whole escalated completely out of control and went to sort of the law firms, if you like, then straight away, then Messi would be in the wrong. He's got not, you know, part of, Part of what he's done is um, illegal, if you like, contractually. So uh, I think that he got wind of that and thought, right, I better be come back and make sure I attend uh, COVID testing and, and pre-season training, all that kind of thing. Um, so that was meant to happen sort of yesterday and then COVID testing sort of today. Um, so he actually didn't turn up for his COVID testing, which was scheduled for 10.15 uh, Spanish time um, and hasn't turned off for the rest of the day. So he hasn't turned off that, which is really, really interesting. So I don't know if some conversations have happened in the interim where he's had a phone call with the president or the owners of Barcelona or even the manager and said, you know, expressed what he's feeling and his demands, etc. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing to also mention as well, there's a bunch of clubs that 
he could go to that probably could afford him. Um, certainly, if he, if he could go for free, they could afford him because um, they haven't got to pay the 700 million euros uh, release clause. But Messi, just to give you some more tech context, earns about a million pounds, um, 1.2 million euros a week. So he earns a lot, a lot of money. So um, clubs that probably could do that or somehow could could afford it would be probably PSG. They've got massively rich owners, um, and they have got Mbappe and they've got Neymar. And imagine if they got Messi, then that would be almost the final sort of. Um, pieces of jigsaw to, for them to go and win the Champions League which is um, what they want the owners want so um, other clubs to mention is Manchester City you know, there's obvious connections there with obviously Pep being there and um, some of the hierarchy in terms of I think Tixie Ber Berestein he's there as well he used to be at Barcelona so there's some sort of connection there um, and a couple of other clubs you could mention if Man, Man United possibly financially could afford it I don't think Messi would want to come to Manchester United because we're not competing at the highest level regularly at the moment um, and then Juventus and Inter Milan, the two teams from Italy that um, could appeal to him as well. thing to mention about the Italian um, side of things is they've got a new law for um, overseas imports coming over to play. So i.e. Messi went over to go and play for, um, say, Juventus. Uh, the, the new law for tax is a maximum they can pay is 25%, regardless of how much they earn. So if they earn... Sixty thousand pound a week or five hundred thousand pound a week. The maximum they can get taxed is twenty twenty five percent. So probably another reason why Cristiano Ronaldo actually went over there, and um, you know, there's been a few others as well that have gone over there as well. So there's a new law for overseas uh, foreign assets, if you like, that can sort of help them financially. Not that Messi needs the money, but it just adds a another tick, if you like, in the box of actually it's another reason why I joined the club. Um, there also has been others things that have come out in the press. So as the week sort of evolved, um, apparently Messi and Pep Guardiola have had a phone call, um, a three-hour phone call it, last week, uh, which is really, really interesting. Obviously, he was probably sort of getting a gist of, uh, if this is, um, it's, again, this is speculation, and I don't know if this is 100% true, guys. It's obviously coming out through the media. But if, you know, hypothetically, if, say, if this, 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 sorry, hypothetically, if this, 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 get my words out now, hypothetically, if this did happen, and he did have that conversation with Pep Guardiola, he's probably talking about, can do you want me there? Can you afford me? Um, where do you see me playing? What's the team looking like? I want to play for you. All them, all them kind of things. You know, for three hour you know phone call, there's going to be lots of conversation. It's not just going to be about how's your family, how's your kids. You know, all them kind of things. There's going to be lots of sort of things that Messi probably wants some sort of reassurances. So that was interesting. And another uh, sort of um, thing to sort of mention on top of that as well. One of the owners of Manchester City, um, someone Mubarak, I don't know what his first name is, he did an interview um, the back end of last week, so before the Messi sort of thing um, come out. I think it might have been the, the Friday or the Saturday. Um, it was viewed on, it was aired on Sky as well, so it was quite interesting. And basically he was saying that um, predominantly most of our players, um, our strategy is to buy young, hungry players between age, say, 20 and 24, um, and then progress them and develop them and turn them into sort of serial winners. The best sort of young, hot prospects, if you like, and try and develop them in, in that way. Um, and if they don't go for those types of players, they go for, generally speaking, players between the age of 24 and 27. So a bit more established, but still have got a, a resale value for, for both categories, if you like. They don't really go, right, I'm going to buy a 31-year-old or a 32-year-old, you know, anyone like that. The, the only exception is maybe the goalkeeping department where they've got a bit more sort of years in their bodies, if you, if you like. But he said, interestingly, that they're more open now to buying an older player, which at the time when I heard the comment, and I'm sure many others as well, would have just thought it was a passing comment. Um, and you wouldn't think anything of it. So he's just maybe you know, just talking generally, you know, openly about maybe their strategy sort of, you know, in the, in the transfer market. And now that's happened. And then a few days later, the messy situation has happened. People are putting two and two together. Me, for one, definitely do, I am doing that. Um, and th people are thinking, was that him sort of knowing what happened with the phone call with Pep and um, Messi, you know, in advance? So everyone's sort of putting the the pieces together and thinking, though well, that adds up to that and that equals that, etc. And it's all kind of leading to one way, um, which is really really interesting. Um, so 
that's sort of the messy situation, guys. We could go on for for you know a lot longer talking about it and how we'd fit in and you know you know would Man City win the league? Would it be a lot? I've heard a lot of people say on st online streams and social media, Messi goes to Manchester City, they've won the league, automatic, no competition. Like I'm thinking, don't get me wrong, they're going to be favourites, but I don't think it's going to be like they're going to win the league by 25 points or anything like that. Like how so many people are talking, you know. Um, and we'll move on to other news because there's loads more to talk about, guys. So, yeah, Harry Maguire. So, another major incident that's sort of gone under the, the radar a little bit, if you like, since the messy news has sort of come to um, the forefront of everyone's minds, if you like. So, he was arrested um, uh, for three counts. I can't remember all three counts, but um, on a holiday in Greece. Um, so, basically, he got arrested for... Uh, what's rumoured that the reason why he got arrested was that he um, reacted uh, aggressively uh, and negatively towards police officers um, wasn't sort of uh, obliging to the officers either wasn't um, being compliant if you like um, um, and the, re the reason why the Maguire sort of you know if these are true again I'm, I'm talking allegedly in this whole Maguire situation guys um, if now the reason why this sort of story came out was apparently him and his some of his friends and family were out having some drinks in Greece like you do you know in your holidays and stuff. And apparently two Albanian men come in and um, jabbed his sister named Daisy apparently, um, and it's some sort of date rape drug. Um, and apparently she almost collapsed immediately. And you know, as an older brother, you automatically react to me. What the hell's going on here? Loads of commotion going on, and then one thing's led to another. So I'll give you sort of the police side of things if you like. Um, what they're saying is that um, that's that incident's happened, and then McGuire saying like, and his family and the people that are there saying, guys, like um, these guys, these Albanians have done something to us. What's going on? You know, there's there's so much to talk about, but basically, I, I'm not going to go into all of it. But there's all alleged stuff. And this Harry McGuire went to court. Um, he was in prison for a couple of days. Came back to the UK, but he went to uh, he went to court to the, the Greek courts, and um, he was given a 21 month and 10 day sentence, uh, prison sentence, uh, suspended to sentence, sentence. Sorry. Um, on the back of that, McGuire and his legal team of um, what's the word I'm looking for? They have appealed. Sorry, appealed for um, a retrial, and that has been successful. So. As it stands right now, is they're in the retrial period, which is really, really interesting to see how that develops as well. Um, I won't. I don't want to talk about it too much because it's. I don't want to paint a picture negatively for one person, but equally, I don't want to defend that person too much as well. But there's an incident happened in Greece. Um, he got obviously, like I said, a, a 21 month and 10 day suspension, but it's now been appealed and overturned, so we get a retrial. Um, moving on, there's loads more to talk about. Harry Kane. He had to quarantine after his holiday in Bahamas. So he was on, basically on holiday in the Bahamas. Um, and then whilst he was away, um, the Jamaica, which is obviously the country where Bahamas is in, they um, became one of the, the countries where if you had visited on, on holiday, then you would have to quarantine. So he's had to have a 14-day quarantine, um, which he has not played for Spurs in any of the preseason games because of that. So it was a little bit behind schedule in terms of sort of play, a minute, play minutes and sharpness and fitness and that kind of thing. Um, he hasn't tested positive or anything like that, guys, so it all seems fine there. Um, incidentally, he is going to be teaming up with the England squad, which I believe that's going to be sort of today slash tomorrow, going into the early part of next week, so or this week coming up, sorry, should I say. Um, Gareth Barry, a bit of a sad one, guys. So Gareth Barry has uh, retired from playing football. He is the Premier League, um, so he's made the most Premier League appearances um, with 650 odd appearances or something like that, guys. So he has basically effectively hanged up his boots or hung up his boots, sorry to say, guys. And uh, he's had a, a, a lustrous and I wouldn't say glittering, but definitely a lustrous career playing for the likes of Villa, City, uh, I think he was at West Brom, um, and, and a bunch of other clubs as well he's played for. But he's. He's had a massive, massive career. Um, so yeah, bit sad news there. He's retired, and be interesting to see where he sort of sees his next path, where he goes 
into coaching, into sort of TV management, just takes a backseat from football altogether. Um, but yeah, good luck to to Gareth Barry and see see how sort of his career or his next part of his career develops. Uh, some more sort of sad news, guys, as well. Um, Paul Pogba and Tanganga, the the young fullback that plays for Spurs, both those have tested positive for COVID nineteen. So. Um, they were both called up for the international uh, break, which is happening um, this week coming up for France, and they've been tested positive, so they have now have to go through 14-day um, quarantine periods of isolation, if you like, um, and they won't be meeting up with the French squad. So, from France's point of view, this is obviously really negative, especially you know, Pogba, who's in you know, decent form back end of last year. Um, but from Man United's point of view, I suppose it's a positive because then he's going to be you know, staying, he's not going to get injured potentially away with France, you know, um, he's not going to get overused or anything like that, so he might be a little bit more fresh maybe going into the season. Um, uh, moving on as well, Raheem Sterling, so he had to take a COVID-19 test, so the backstory of this is um, Usain Bolt had a party for, it might have been his birthday or something like that, he had a party anyway, and Sterling was invited, he was there, um, and then in the days after that, Usain Bolt has tested positive for COVID-19, so basically everyone that attended that party had to take a COVID-19 test, and which Sterling did, and thankfully it's come up negative, so he is fine. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that means in terms of him, him having to uh, join up with the rest of the group or not. Um, I don't even know if Manchester City are back training yet, so it might, that, it might be that they're not back yet because of what happened in Europe. Um, but nevertheless, it's obviously he's tested negative, which is a good thing. And then the last thing I just want to talk about is the, the England squad. So, um, Gareth Southgate has announced his England squad for the upcoming games against Denmark and Iceland. Um, and it's very interesting to see there's some newbies in there, there's some senior pros in there, all the sort of main players are in there, like you kind of expect. But like, the, like I said, there's a few sort of um, newbies and, and debutants, if you like, in the squad. Um, I will just say that Harry Maguire was um, selected for the England squad and then he was deselected on the back of um, him getting the 21 month and 10 day uh, suspended prison, prison sentence. Um, obviously on the back of that, since then he's he's got a retrial but he's still going to be left outside the squad. So I'll just run through the squad now anyway. Three goalkeepers, you've got Dean Henderson who incidentally has signed a new contract for Manchester United this this uh, this week. I believe it's around £120,000 a week, a new five-year contract with a view of signing a six-year contract um, if he wants to, and the club agreed to it. <clears throat> Jordan Pickford, who's uh, the number one at the moment, and then you've got Nick Pope, who arguably was the goalkeeper of the season last year. Um, so no surprises in there. Defence-wise, you've got Trent Alexander-Arnold, um, Eric Dyer, Joe Gomez, Michael Keane, Tyron Mings, Kieran Trippier and Carl Walker. So, my initial thoughts for that was there's no left back. There's no Chilwell because he's, he's injured at the moment so he's he's not being risked. Um, there's no Luke Shaw because he's injured as well. There's no Danny Rose. I don't think he just isn't good enough at the moment. He's not in favour if you like. Um, there's no Brandon Williams for example, the, the young United fullback. So it's interesting to see there's no left backs. The only players I can think of that could play left back are Joe Gomez, which he hasn't done for a while, but I remember when he was first at Liverpool, he did play a few games at left back, so he could play there. And the other one I can think of is Tyron Mings, um, who is a left footed player uh, who could play there. Um, thinking about it as well, actually, he, he, he might be thinking he could play one of Trent, Carl Walker, or Trippier, maybe Trippier at left back. Uh, Having said that, guys, there has been a couple of new additions defensively in the squad as of last night. So I'm really, really pleased that Conor Cody's actually uh, been selected for the England squad. He's, I think he was the only Wolves player last season to play every minute of every game in all competitions. So he's been selected, another centre-half. And then the young lad, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, who's sort of had a really strong and um, sort of class end to the season, if you like. With, um, with Arsenal and he continued that yesterday you think he might have even got man of the match um, so he's been called up as well so he could actually be the one that could play as a wing back thinking about it now um, not sure if he would play as a left back but interesting to see how that sort of plays out moving on to the midfield Phil Foden absolutely ecstatic that he's in the squad um, 
he is Rolls Royce of a midfielder. Uh, Mason Mount, he's in the squad, he's been quite regular recently. Declan Rice is in the squad, Ward Prowse is in the squad, I'm really pleased for him. Um, I can't believe no one's shown massive like shown interest um, in signing them. But let me rephrase that. People might have shown interest, it's just not been made in the public eye. But he is a class player, he could play in if any of the top six clubs in my opinion. Um, he has incidentally has signed a new contract actually at Southampton. You've got Harry Winks in there, who's a, a sort of a nice sort of technical player if you like in the in the in the pivot position if you like in midfield. Um, and then the other player I want to mention is Calvin Phillips. So he has actually he hasn't actually played a minute in the Premier League yet. Um, if he plays for Leeds United, to just be promoted to the Premier League, but there was rumours of him actually being selected in the England squad when he was in the Championship last season. So. Uh, you know, he's obviously playing really well. He's a, he's a more of a holding type of midfielder. He's an aggressive type of midfielder as well. Um, so a couple of players that have sort of not been selected in there. You've got Jesse Lingard, for obvious reasons. He's just not in form at all. Deli Alley's not been selected either. You've got Jordan Henson. Jordan Henson hasn't been selected. Um, but Jordan Henson obviously more so because of injury. More so, more so I would say. And then you've got... Moving on to the forwards, you've got Tammy Abraham. You've got Mason Groomwood, who I'm really pleased about. His form absolutely deserves to be... Uh, where he is. Danny Ings is another one. He obviously was, I think he finished second in the Golden Boot race last year. Um, Harry Kane, obviously captain. Marcus Rashford, Jaden Sancho and Raheem Sterling. Um, I will just add, uh, Mason Mount and Tammy Abram have had to um, self-isolate for 14 days. Um, I'm not sure when that happened. And I'm not sure the reason why they had to do that. I'm not sure, I don't know if they, similar to Sterling, attended a party and then they had to uh, self-isolate for, for a period of time. But, They've either completed their 14 days or they're, they're about to. or um, So I'm not sure, basically, if they're going to be meeting up with the England players or not. But they were, like, they missed the Chelsea friendly yesterday because of it. But they might meet up with the rest of the squad, say, you know, Tuesday time or something like that. I don't know. Um, but that's the England squad. Very interesting. Um, like I said, there's a few omissions in there in terms of uh, left backs, for example, because of injuries, midfielders because of four man injuries. Um, I'll probably say the, the advanced players, the attacking players, is probably everyone um, that you kind of expect. The only one I would say that maybe could have been in there is Calvert Lewin, possibly. Um, he was showing signs of um, maturity and sort of development in his game, sec certainly in the second part of last season, in a way. Um, more so under sort of um, Big Ferguson and Ancelotti. So, guys, that's the, that the England squad, and that's the end of today's episode. Loads and loads to sort of talk about, like I mentioned. Um, there's going to be a final sort of... Um, there'll be probably two more preview shows going into the Premier League season. There'll be one next week and then one probably on the on the eve of the Premier League. So the, the Premier League starts on the Saturday. Um, and then obviously there'll probably be one on the Friday night. So, yes, guys... And like I said earlier on the, on the show, about the sort of the beginning, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, click the subscribe button right now. You'll get a notification come through to say that a video has been uploaded on the channel. Um, so you won't miss any content that's been up, uploaded. Um, please leave a like and leave a comment as well. I'll try and get back to as many comments as I can. And we'll see everyone on the next episode.